Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messier, and I'm here at the Canadian Starfighter Museum looking at a pair of spurs. But not for a horse, for something a little bit more powerful, the Lockheed F-104 Starfighter, which you can see behind me. Now, Starfighter pilots were quite fond of wearing these. They became known as cowboys for it. But the purpose of the spurs themselves is a little less glamorous because these were part of the aircraft's escape system, the ejection seat. And the idea was when you climbed into the aircraft, you would kick the sockets on the back here into a set of matching balls in the foot pans of the ejection seat. And those would be connected to a set of spring-loaded cables. Now, those cables didn't interfere with your operation of the rudder pedals, but as soon as you pulled the ejection handles, it would retract your feet back into the seat right before the seat fired. The idea, of course, being to keep your feet out of the way and to stop them from flopping around and being injured as you exited the aircraft. Now, this was particularly important on some of the earlier versions of the Starfighter for reasons that we'll get to in a second. Now, I think these are particularly cool because these represent a specific point in the evolution of crew escape systems, which has been going on for a lot longer than you might think. So in the early days of aviation, the only way of escaping from a stricken aircraft was to jump out and open your parachute, assuming you had a parachute. Uh, during the First World War, not many pilots actually carried parachutes for a number of reasons. First, they thought it was a sign of cowardice, and second, their officers thought that it would encourage them to you know, abandon their aircraft at the first sign of trouble rather than trying to bring back this very expensive machine. About the only air crew that regularly carried parachutes were balloon observers who actually had a type of automatic parachute. This was stored in a tube on the side of the balloon gondola. And if they were in trouble, if their balloon was attacked and was on fire, they just had to jump over the side and their shrouds would pull the parachute out of the tube automatically. But even when parachutes became commonplace among pilots, it was still very difficult to bail out of an aircraft because of G-forces, because of aerodynamic forces that stopped you from getting out. And this was even harder if your aircraft was out of control, if you were injured or otherwise incapacitated. And so a lot of pilots died while trying to bail out or ended up striking the tail or some other part of the aircraft and becoming extremely injured or dying. So very early in the age of aviation, various inventors tried to come up with systems to automatically eject the pilot from the airframe. And one of the earliest was invented by an Austro-Hungarian officer named Baron Odkolek, and he tested this all the way back in 1912, so even before the First World War. And this was followed by a number of other inventors throughout the 1910s and 1920s, but serious research into ejection seats didn't take place until the end of the 1930s. And one of the first military aircraft to be fitted with one was the Swedish Saab 21, and here this made a lot of sense because the Saab 21 was a pusher aircraft. It had a propeller in the back. And if the pilot tried to bail out in the conventional manner, well, he was likely to strike the propeller and have a very bad day. Uh, they were, the Swedes were followed by the Germans, especially the Heinkel Company, who installed an early pneumatic seat in the Heinkel 280, which was an unsuccessful competitor to the Messerschmitt 262, which, of course, became the first operational jet fighter. And in 1942, test pilot Helmut Schenk became the first pilot to use an ejection seat in an emergency when he used it to bail out of a Heinkel 280 at Recklin Airfield. Now, the Germans installed ejection seats in a number of other aircrafts, including the uh, Heinkel 219 Yuhu, which was a night fighter, and this was the first operational aircraft to be fitted with an ejection seat the Heinkel 162 Volksjäger, which was a small jet aircraft that was meant to be piloted by the Hitler Youth, as well as the Dornier 335 Fiel, which uh, had a, both a tractor and a pusher propeller, and it, the seat was coupled with explosive bolts that actually jettisoned the entire tail unit so that the pilot didn't eject straight into the tail and the propeller. And while the earlier seats were pneumatic, the later seats were cartridge fired. They actually used a propellant cartridge, very much like a shotgun cartridge, to fire the pilot out of the aircraft. Now, while the Germans were the early pioneers of ejection seat technology, it was really the British that carried the torch for the rest of the 20th century, especially the Martin Baker Company, 
Now, the Martin Baker Company actually started as a regular aircraft manufacturer, and they produced a number of prototype touring and fighter aircraft throughout the 1930s and 1940s, culminating in the MB-5, which by all accounts was an excellent aircraft, but came too late in the Second World War to be adopted. But in the testing of the MB-3 prototype, Valentine Baker of Martin Baker died in a crash, and this really focused the company's uh, attention onto escape systems, a market which they still dominate to this day. So the first Martin Baker ejection seat test took place in 1946, and this was conducted by a very brave and gloriously mustachioed man named Bernard Lynch, who would do a lot of the early tests for Martin Baker. And he ejected out of the back of a Gloucester Meteor fighter. And what's interesting is that Martin Baker still uses a pair of meteors to this day as their test bed for ejection seats. And up until October 2015, when the company bought the aircraft outright and put them on the Civil Register, these were the two oldest military aircraft still in service in the world, and they're still going strong some 80 years later, so really kind of cool. And over the span of the late 1940s and 1950s, uh, Martin Baker really took the ejection seat concept into the modern age, and one of the improvements that they created was automated seat sequencing. So the very earliest uh, ejection seats, all they really did for you was kick you out of the aircraft. You then were on your own, you had to detach yourself from the seat, you had to open your own parachute, you had to do all of this manually. And again, very difficult to do if you're disoriented, if you're incapacitated, if you're injured. And so Martin Baker's seats introduced you know, automatic mechanisms that would deploy a drogue chute to stabilize the seat, that would automatically cut you out of the seat, and then deploy your parachute for you so that all you had to do was pull the ejection handles and off you went. Another innovation that they introduced was a different location for those ejection handles. So the very earliest seats had what's known as a face shroud ejection handle, which was overhead, and you would pull that down and it would put a sheet of fabric over your face. This did a couple of things. Number one, it protected you from wind blasts and stopped your helmet and your oxygen mask from being torn off. And it also put you in a proper position with your elbows in so that you wouldn't get injured exiting the aircraft. But what pilots found was that if they were in a spin or some other high G situation, it was very difficult for them to lift their arms and actually grab onto that handle. So Martin Baker introduced another handle between the legs where you could quickly move your hands from the control column to the handle, and it also put you in the correct position for ejection. And other seats have copied this, and other seats also have, say, side ejection handles for much the same reason. So while these early seats were a great step forward, they did have some limitations, and one of those had to do with acceleration. So the later German seats and the early Martin Baker seats, as I said, were cartridge-fired. And the problem was you could only use so large of a cartridge until the acceleration became so great that it caused spinal compression and back injuries. Uh, Martin Baker did alleviate this problem somewhat by using multiple staggered cartridges to sort of smooth out the acceleration, but there was still a limit to the speed that you could attain within that short distance where you would injure the pilot. And this became something of a problem with the introduction of the F-104 Starfighter. You'll see that the aircraft has an extremely tall T-tail, and the ejection seats of the era were not able to reliably have the pilot clear the tail and not run into it. So the first models of the F-104 actually had a downward firing ejection seat, the Stanley C-1. And how this worked was then you initiated the ejection sequence, a hatch in the floor would pop open and be torn away by the airstream, and then the seat would fire you downward through that hatch. And you can see why the spurs were especially needed in that case, because if you have your legs out operating the rudder pedals and you're ejected through a much smaller hole, your legs are getting torn off. So that was a vital piece of equipment. Now, if the ejection seat failed, if the cartridge failed, you could actually initiate a system where you would detach the seat from the rails and it would just fall out the bottom. Now that's all great if you're operating at the high speeds and altitudes that the Starfighter was designed for, but it didn't quite work out that way. The Starfighter actually had only a brief service life in the US Air Force, but many were exported to other countries such as Canada 
and Germany, where they were used in the low-level attack role. And this is an aircraft, again, designed for high-speed climb, for operation at high speeds and high altitudes. It has a very high wing loading, and this made it very dangerous in low-level operations. It gave it a very high stall speed, a very high landing speed. And the accident rate, especially in German service, gave it the nickname the Widowmaker. And one of the things that made the earlier versions especially dangerous was the ejection seats. So in U.S. Air Force service, in the very first year of its deployment, uh, 21 starfighter pilots were killed in ejection accidents. So this led them later to install upward firing ejection seats. But that actually didn't stop the deaths because as sort of a stopgap measure, pilots were trained, if possible, to turn their aircraft over, to roll it over and eject upwards. This would give them a little bit more altitude in which to deploy their parachute. The problem was when they switched to upwards firing ejection seats, a lot of the pilots retained this training, and when it came time to eject, they resorted to muscle memory, rolled the aircraft over, and ejected themselves downwards right into the ground. So, a couple of interesting details to point out on this Stanley C2 seat. So, in addition to the system with the spurs that would pull the pilot's feet in, there was a separate system to restrain their arms to stop them from flailing about and being injured on the way out of the aircraft. And that is this system of webbing straps right here. And that's connected to a set of swinging arms so that when the pilot initiates ejection, a split second before the seat fires, at the same time as their legs are being drawn in, those arms swing forward and pull the webbing to the front of the seat, pulling in the pilot's arms. Now there's another webbing strap along the back of the seat here, and that's called the butt kicker. And that is part of the mechanism that separates the pilot from the seat. So once the seat has safely cleared the aircraft, once the drogue is deployed and everything is safe, uh, an automatic take-up reel pulls that strap taut and sort of kicks the pilot out of the seat. At the same time, there's a pair of guillotines that cut the cables to the spurs, releasing the pilot's feet. Then, as they start to freefall, there is a barometer in the parachute that prevents the parachute from opening until the pilot has reached an altitude below 10,000 feet. And there's two reasons for this. Number one, uh, at higher altitudes, the air isn't thick enough for the parachute to properly deploy. And the second reason has to do with oxygen. When the pilot is separated from their seat, they're separated from the onboard oxygen supply. And you really don't want the pilot to be falling very slowly on a parachute through altitudes where they can't breathe, where they will suffer from hypoxia. So this allows the pilot to free fall to a safe altitude where their parachute can properly deploy and where they can just breathe regular air on their way to the ground. Now, speaking of those guillotines, in the case where a pilot makes a crash landing or is otherwise injured and needs to be pulled out of the cockpit by rescue crews, the rescue crews had to pull this handle. And that would activate the guillotines and separate the pilot's feet from the seat so that the crews didn't have to unbuckle the spurs. Now there's one last detail here, a feature of ejection seat design that we haven't talked about yet. And that's this. And this is called a canopy breaker or an egg tooth. And in the case where the canopy fails to jettison, this allows the seat to punch straight through it. And many seats today are fitted with canopy breakers, especially the ones on aircraft that have a regular canopy jettison sequence. Other aircraft will have a system where they have explosive cord embedded in the canopy itself, and a split second before the seat fires, that cord will detonate and shatter the canopy so that the seat can go straight through it. Now, I know what you're thinking. What about that scene from Top Gun where Goose dies? Could that have actually happened? And the answer there is surprisingly, maybe. So the F-14 Tomcat in the era that the film depicts in the mid-1980s was fitted with a version of the Martin Baker Mark 7 seat, which was not fitted with canopy breakers. Thus, the F-14 had an ejection sequence where the canopy would be released first, and there was a lanyard leading from the canopy to an interlock system that would not allow the seats to fire until the canopy had cleared. The problem was, in a flat spin, the F-14 had this habit of the canopy floating in this low pressure region of separated air above the aircraft, so it actually wouldn't fully separate. 
But in that case, then the lanyard wouldn't have been pulled and the seats wouldn't have fired anyway. So it's sort of a, a half truth. Uh, in, under extreme circumstances, something like that might happen. Uh, a couple of Navy pilots did die uh, hitting the canopy under extreme circumstances, but probably not. So there we go. Whether your childhood is saved or childhood is ruined, you're welcome. So the F-104 was not the only aircraft to have this problem of low-level, low-speed ejection. Pretty much every aircraft of this era had the exact same problem because ejection seats at this time were designed to work within a certain performance envelope, a range of altitudes and speed that would give you enough time for your parachute to fully deploy. So at extremely low altitude and extremely low speeds, the seat wouldn't work. So if you were rolling down the runway and you weren't going fast enough, you didn't want to punch out uh, unless you were going at, say, 90 knots, which is the minimum speed for some of the early Martin Baker seats, because you just wouldn't have enough airspeed, wouldn't have enough altitude, your parachute wouldn't fully deploy, and you would just fall to the ground and be seriously injured or killed. And because of this problem, uh, companies like Martin Baker developed what's known as the zero zero seat, which stands for zero airspeed, zero altitude. And these get around that acceleration problem with the cartridge by using a small rocket motor, which allows for a more gradual acceleration and also allows the seat to rise to a much greater height, giving it time to deploy the parachute. And the parachute deployment is also much faster because of a, it's essentially a mortar that fires a little slug attached to a cable to the parachute that literally shoots the parachute out of its container so that it can deploy very quickly. And using a zero zero seat, you can be sitting on the runway on the tarmac at zero speed, pull the ejection handles, and you will automatically be deposited on your parachute quite safely. So you don't really have to do much thinking other than pulling the ejection handles. And this is a great boon for pilots as an Israeli pilot learned in a rather amusing incident in 1985. So this pilot was flying over the desert and the next thing he knows, he is lying on the ground on the desert floor with his parachute deployed and he has no idea what's happened. It's not until he removes his helmet and notices that it's spattered in feathers and blood that he realizes what's happened. He suffered a bird strike and the bird went straight through the windscreen and hit his head, knocking him unconscious, but also hitting his upper ejection handle and ejecting him. So it both destroyed his aircraft and almost killed him, but also saved him at the same time. So if there are ever incidents that make you believe a higher power is looking out for you, I think that would be one of them. So, so far we've talked about low speed, low altitude ejections, but what about the opposite? What about ejecting at extremely high speeds and high altitudes? Well, in the late 1950s, early 1960s, when aircraft started reaching speeds of Mach 2 or even Mach 3 in the case of the A-12, the SR-71, or the XB-70 Valkyrie, designers became concerned that pilots wouldn't be able to survive ejection in these conditions using regular ejection seats. The wind blast would be too strong, the atmospheric frictional heating would be too great. So a number of companies, including Stanley, which developed the early seats for the F-104, started developing crew escape capsules to protect pilots in these conditions. And so one of the most famous of these was developed for the B-58 Hustler supersonic bomber. And it was this little egg-shaped capsule that was integrated around the ejection seat. And the pilot could pull a set of handles and a door would close down the front and seal him inside and the control column and the throttle were still actually inside the capsule so you could continue to fly the aircraft while he was all turtled up. And then if he decided he wanted to eject, pulled another handle and the whole capsule left the aircraft, protecting him from the wind blasts and the heating. And when it landed, if he happened to land in water, the capsule was buoyant, it acted as a life raft. And interestingly enough, they tested these by using anesthetized bears. Uh, which they thought, you know, were the same size and build physiology as humans. And so the very first creature to survive a supersonic ejection was actually a black bear. Now, similar capsules were developed for the XB-70 Valkyrie, only in this case, the seat was actually separate from the capsule. And when you pulled the ejection handle, the seat would retract into the capsule, it would close and eject you. And in 1966, uh, when the Valkyrie prototype was lost in a, a tragic air collision, uh, the pilot of the Valkyrie was actually seriously injured when his arm got caught in the closing door. He survived, but his co-pilot was not as lucky. 
Another way of going about this is to eject the entire cockpit itself. And this was used on the General Dynamics F-111 Aardvark, as well as early versions of the B-1A bomber, although this was later deleted for weight considerations. Now, despite all this work on sophisticated crew escape capsules, it was later discovered that due to the atmosphere being thin at high altitudes, the wind blast from supersonic ejection actually wasn't all that bad. And so pilots of the A-12 and the SR-71 just used regular ejection seats with protection being provided by their pressure suits. And in a discussion of bizarre ejection systems, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Stanley Yankee escape system, which was developed for use in the Sky Raider. And the thinking behind this was, okay, ejection seats are great, but they're heavy, and do you really need all that weight? Why not just yank the pilot out and nothing else? So the Yankee system consisted of a pair of tractor rockets mounted in the rear of the canopy, and when the system was initiated, those would be launched out until this very long cord attached to the pilot's harness went taut. The rockets would ignite, they were spin stabilized, they rotated around an axis, and then it would yank the pilot bodily out of the aircraft and allow him to deploy his parachute. So really bizarre way of going about it, but hey, it works. So there you have it, a very brief history of ejection seats, still a vital piece of aviation safety equipment to this day saves thousands of lives. According to Martin Baker's estimates, their products specifically have saved over 7,500 lives since they went into business. Now, a special thanks to Steve Pajot of the Canadian Starfighter Museum, as well as the Heritage staff at 17 Wing for lending me those spurs, as well as this rather fetching Royal Canadian Air Force tartan bow tie that I'm wearing. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities, where we'll have a look at another fascinating artifact, just like those spurs. Until that time, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.